I'm really excited to be here and uh, tell you about uh, our efforts in the Cancer Genome Atlas project. Probably many of you already know and are quite familiar with TCGA, so I will not spend much time telling you about it, but uh, just to get everyone up to speed, I'll, I'll say a few words about what the project is and what the overall goals of the project are. Uh, the project is a large national project to characterize approximately 30 different tumor types using a variety of different technologies, measurement technologies, red, ranging from DNA sequencing to RNA sequencing, DNA methylation measurements, copy number measurements, uh, clinical data, uh, and, and, many, and many other kinds of uh, data. What's really special about this project is that all of these data come from the same samples. So the, the philosophy is no platform left behind. Uh, the idea is to genera generate all these data from the, sa from the same primary tumor samples from over 30 different types of cancer with, uh, with clinical data as well. And this, this project is a distributed project uh, in multiple centers across the country. Uh, our center is in Seattle uh, at the Institute for Systems Biology, uh, partnered with MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, uh, Wei Zhang's lab. Uh, and these centers do many different things, uh, ranging from sequencing to characterizing uh, the tumors using the other uh, measurement uh, technologies like methylation and copy number changes. Uh, and then there are also analysis centers, and uh, ours is one of those, uh, genome data analysis centers that integrates all of these data and analyzes them and makes it available to the community. This is our website, uh, cancerregulome.org. Uh, on it, you can find links to our tools and to other resources that we make available to the community. Okay, so that's all I'll say about the TCGA project, and I'll just jump in into what we're actually doing with it and what is our role in this project. So this is our basic ingredient. We call it a feature matrix. A feature matrix is just a large matrix of data from some particular tumor type or subtype or set of tumor types. Okay, that's, that's up to the user. But the basic idea is that the rows of this matrix uh, are the samples and uh, the, the columns are the features. We call them features, so hence the feature matrix. So these features uh, can be gene expressions or mutations or copy number segments or clinical data and so on. So uh, you, can, you can imagine that this is a very heterogeneous matrix that is comprised of numerical, discrete, binary, categorical, all kinds of different data, including missing data as well. And so when we analyze this, we have to be mindful of the type of data that is in there and apply the, the appropriate statistical techniques to identify relationships. And we have these matrices for different tumor types. So these four letter acronyms are simply, uh, they're signifying the different tumor types like breast cancer, glioblastoma, kidney, lung, ovarian, and so on. And the most common question that people typically want to ask with these matrices, with these data sets, is what's correlated to what? What's correlated to my favorite gene mutation? What's correlated to this particular subtype of cancer? Or uh, what are the correlations between uh, genes that are differentially expressed and nearby methylation probes or microRNAs? So people want to obviously ask very different questions. Some of those questions are clinically motivated, and some of these questions are more mechanistically or, uh, oriented, where people really want to understand the, the mechanistic underpinnings of the tumorigenesis from these data sets. And so that's the kind of the basic ingredient. Given this matrix, can we identify correlations in a way that's very, very flexible and allows people to mine the data and ask the next questions very quickly? So this, so this idea is indicated by these red arrows showing that we were interested in identifying correlations between the different features or the different columns of this matrix. So let me just jump in and give you an example of uh, one such example of correlations for uh, the colorectal cancer project that, that was published a few years ago. So in colorectal cancer, uh, we wanted to identify molecular signatures of aggressiveness. 
Now we know that some cancers have metastasis, some don't. Some are early stage tumors, some are late stage tumors. Uh, we can look at what fraction uh, uh, are of the nodes are positive by H&E staining. Is there lymphatic invasion or vascular invasion present? And is the histological type more or less aggressive or mucinous or non-mucinous? And then for each of these features, we want to find, we want to compute the correlations to molecular features, gene expressions, mutations, copy number, alterations. Uh, and we do that by combining the p-values using an old method from Fisher uh, to, to combine statistical tests. Uh, and that's, that's the formula there. So we use these six features that I showed you on the previous slide and combine the p-values. That's actually a weighted method because we want to equalize the contributions from these clinical variables. Some of them are more strongly associated than others. Uh, so we, we get a combined p-value for the association of any molecular feature to the what we call aggressiveness. So we can come up with an aggressiveness score, if you will. A high aggressiveness score would mean that that particular feature, let's say gene expression, is strongly associated with aggressive colorectal cancer. And then, of course, people want to explore these associations and see, see what's in there. So uh, these are just some figures from the paper. Uh, one, one such strong association is apolipoprotein L6. It's a gene found only in human. And that's one of the strongest uh, associations with aggressiveness. There are others, some of them quite well known, like APC and members in the wind signaling pathway, which are almost always aberrated in colorectal cancer, PIK3CA, BRAF. A new one that was not previously implicated, FBXW7, its structure is shown right here with the mutations actually inside this beta propeller structure, which is involved in uh, ubiquitin-mediated degradation of beta-catenin in the wind signaling pathway. We found that many of these uh, features associated with aggressiveness cluster in hotspots on the genome. So in other words, they occur in close proximity to each other on genomic coordinates. And so we built a tool to explore that. This is a screenshot of Regulome Explorer, which I'll be showing you later. And you can see that these features, uh, which are color-coded based on uh, the type of data that they signify, so blue is gene expression, green is methylation, orange is copy number variation, and purple is microRNA expression. These features are clustered in hotspots. And these uh, red and blue bubbles indicate the significance score, in, in other words, the p-value of the association with, with aggressiveness. We can look at this genome-wide. This is an interactive tool that, is, that runs in the web browser. So you can actually uh, click around and move around in this tool and uh, zoom in and identify and look at the features that are correlated with uh, aggressive disease. And then from that, you can, uh, this is also one of the figures from the paper, you can identify the strongest candidates. For example, this one at the top of the list, SCN5A, uh, is well known to be involved in colon cancer invasion. So there are some known players here. Uh, also, uh, for example, deletion of 1P36, also well known and characterized in colorectal cancer. But then there are other ones that are less well characterized and these are all available for interactive exploration. Uh, and you can actually zoom in and uh, travel along the genome and see where these uh, features are located. But ultimately, we want to be able to perform this kind of association with anything, not just with a feature like aggressiveness, which was motivated by this particular project, but you can't really know ahead of time what, people, what kind of questions people would want to ask. So, to that end, we actually perform all correlations. We do all pair statistical tests, of course, correcting for multiple testing appropriately. And we generate a large uh, matrix of associations, which is filtered down. We filter out the, the non-significant ones and only keep the most significant ones. And then we load these associations into our tool, Regulome Explorer, to allow people to browse the associations in any way that they want. So Regulome Explorer is available from the website I gave you earlier or directly from explorer.cancerregulome.org. You can load the latest data sets 
immediately. So the papers that are published by TCGA, like breast cancer, thyroid cancer, and, uh, and others, you can just click on that and it'll load the latest, uh, well, not necessarily the latest, but uh, you can either get the latest uh, data set or the data set that was used for the marker publication, which is not always the latest one. Uh, you are then greeted with a screen like this, where you see the genome, and these are the chromosomes that are going around the circle. And the most prominent associations are shown by arcs. So if you see an arc between genomic feature A and B, it means that th those two genomic features are strongly statistically associated in the data. And if you actually click on one of those arcs, you will be presented with the underlying evidence, like a scatter plot or a box plot or whatever, whatever the data are, depending on whether they are categorical or continuous or binary. And you will see the underlying data. Each dot there is one patient sample. So you can actually hover over that, uh, each dot and see the TCGA barcode ID for that particular sample and explore the data interactively and graphically, uh, as well as in a uh, spreadsheet type of format where all of the associations are listed as rows in this type of table. And clicking on one of those rows will present you with the same underlying evidence as I just showed you. And you can sort it by any column, by, by the p-values or by correlations and so on. So this is just another way of, uh, of looking at the same data. So here's, here's an example from glioblastoma where we actually select a particular data type like mutation. And in fact, you can even select your favorite gene or set of genes. So here we're looking at IDH1. Okay, it's a well-known player in glioblastoma that's involved in CPG island methylator phenotype. It's a hypermethylator phenotype. So if we look for IDH1, you can see that it's sitting right here, chromosome two. These red tick marks indicate that there are some mutations in that, in that particular, uh, in IDH1. Oh, by the way, this, this is a URL, so everything here is uh, uh, state-based. If I click on this URL, uh, it, it will take me to this exact same view in a browser. I'm not gonna do that now because I don't have internet here. So, uh, if you, see this little circle here, you probably cannot see that, that indicates a clinical association. Clinical associations don't have a genomic location, obviously, it's a clinical association. So if we click on that, we will see that there is a strong association between IDH1 and the CPG island methylator phenotype, which is well known. So this just supports that. And we can also see that there is a strong enrichment and abundance of the proneural subtype in, uh, in the IDH1 mutated samples. Uh, what this allows you to do is to color these scatter plots or box plots, or in this case, it's a contingency table. It's a two by two contingency table. So it allows you to color every patient sample by some other feature. In this case, it's subtype, like mesenchymal, neural, proneural, and, and so on. But you could look at all associations that are, that, are, that are of interest to you, depending on what your questions are. For instance, if you're interested in looking at methylation versus gene expression, you could select methylation for one feature, gene expression for the other feature, you could select uh, a correlation that you want to look only at negative correlations, not positive, but only negative correlations. That's up to you. You can set the stringency as well. And you can also set the, the distance for those associations. So maybe you're only interested in associations that are less than 5,000 base pairs. You're not interested in distal associations, only in proximal associations, which would probably give support to methylation-based silencing, epigenetic silencing of gene expression. So doing that, uh, you, will get, uh, you will get these arcs. You probably, it's hard for you to see them, but these are small arcs. The reason they're small, they're not going all across the genome, is because we have, we have told it not to look for long, uh, distal associations, only look for proximal associations. Hence, you see that picture. And then, of course, clicking on any of those arcs will reveal scatter plots like this, showing the classical relationships between gene expression and methylation, this negative slope. So increased methylation leads to lower gene expression. And again, here we can color, 
color code them based on subtypes, based on any other feature that's available in our feature matrix. So this could be primary versus metastasis, whether it's a BRAF mutant or not a mutant, whatever you want, you can color these scatter plots immediately by that feature. Another example, just kind of flying through this very quickly, uh, is copy number gene expression association. So if you want to find associations that are copy number driven, uh, as opposed to epigenetically driven, as I showed previously, you can also do that here, select proximal associations. Now we're looking for positive correlations, not negative correlations. And here you, you see some scatter plots showing evidence for that. Uh, Another example is microRNA uh, gene expression associations. These are obviously interesting if you want to study microRNA regulatory networks and combining this with uh, target databases that, that inform us about microRNA targets. Here we can also select negative correlations but allow for distal relationships, so interchromosomal relationships. And uh, here's, here's an example of uh, one such uh, analysis with microRNAs. Uh, recently, we did exactly this sort of uh, exploratory analysis that led to uh, some findings uh, about uh, a microRNA regulatory network that underlies epithelial to mesenchymal transition in uh, ovarian carcinoma. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into depth about this story, but just to say that the, these exploratory statistical association tools were used as the first step for this kind of analysis that was then subsequently expanded using cell lines and mouse models. Uh, but again, the, the first steps are really valuable, the first exploratory steps. Uh, the, now jumping to another recent study that was published just last month, uh, in cell is on uh, papillary uh, thyroid carcinomas. This is the largest cohort uh, that has been studied to date, comprising uh, nearly 500 uh, papillary thyroid uh, tumors. Uh, and the predominant mutation uh, in, uh, in uh, PTC is BRAF V600E, the famous mutation. There are also uh, HRAS, KRAS, and RAS mutations uh, that make up uh, the, the next largest set of uh, mutated uh, tumors, and uh, they affect the MAP kinase pathway. Uh, so we separated the, the tumors into BRAF uh, V600E mutated and RAS mutated, uh, and then developed a score for the other uh, tumors that would tell us whether they're more like the BRAF mutated tumors or more like the RAS mutated tumors. And this score was actually based on a 71 gene expression signature uh, using uh, cent centroids computed from the BRAF uh, mutants and from the RAS mutants. And then the centroid of every tumor was then compared to both of those centroids and a score was generated. So uh, a negative score signified a, B a more BRAF-like tumor and a positive score signified more a RAS-like tumor. Uh, also, BRAF uh, mutant uh, Tumors, thyroid tumors, were believed uh, thus far to be one homogeneous group, but they're far from that. It's actually a fairly heterogeneous group, and to get some insight into that, we also developed a thyroid differentiation score that was based on 16 genes, uh, metabolic uh, genes uh, and uh, other functional genes in, uh, in thyroid. And using this differentiation score, again, uh, this, the low score was poorly differentiated, high score means uh, strongly well differentiated, and of course that's also related to aggressiveness. Poorly differentiated cancers are more aggressive. And so we, we developed a, such a score for thyroid differentiation, and then looked for associations that can stratify these different tumors in the molecular level. So our group was particularly involved in the analysis of microRNAs in collaboration with the group in BC Cancer Agency, Gordon Robertson and, and colleagues. And so we identified some, uh, some MERS, some uh, like Oncomer uh, 21, that was strongly associated uh, with this BRAF score. So here's a, here's a screenshot from Regulome Explorer showing on the x-axis uh, MER 21 expression, and then on the y-axis this BRAF score that I just told you about. 
So you can see that the high expressed MER21 samples actually have more of a, have a low BRAF score indicating it's more BRAF-like, and then the low microRNA expressors are more RAS-like, so they have a high score. And also, it's co color-coded by uh, predicted risk, so there is intermediate risk and high risk and low risk, so the red and the gre green is low risk, red is high risk. So you can see that it also stratifies it based on predicted risk. Also, MER21 is strongly associated to the thyroid differentiation score I just mentioned as well, in a similar way. Uh, so, I, one thing I'd like to add is that many of these features are generated by uh, some other secondary analysis, like the BRAF score, differentiation score. So, we can ingest these features into our feature matrix and then subject them to downstream further analysis and association analysis, basically. So, if somebody runs their favorite algorithm for clustering and has some cluster assignments, we can ingest those cluster assignments into our feature matrix and correlate them with everything else, perhaps other cluster assignments from other algorithms or other scores or any other feature in the matrix. Okay, now jumping to the stomach. Uh, this was uh, also a recent publication uh, in Nature uh, from the stomach working group, the gastric uh, working group uh, in TCGA. Uh, this is the list of the group. Uh, I uh, had the privilege of co-chairing this group with Peter Laird uh, and uh, Adam Bass. Uh, also, uh, well, here's the group in front of our institute for our face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, here's Adam, and uh, here's Peter. I also want to acknowledge uh, Vestan Thorson that played a really key role in this working group as an analysis and data coordinator. Made really big contributions. Uh, so gastric cancer is really a terrible cancer. It's uh, 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 third uh, uh, responsible, it's the third uh, uh, most frequent cancer mo mortality cancer in the world. Uh, it, is, it has a number of risk factors that are known, like H. pylori infection, uh, also dietary risk factors, like smoked, salted, uh, preserved, cured fish, it turns out. Uh, also, of course, tobacco, uh, family history, and country and region. We know that there are some countries that have much higher incidence of gastric cancer, China, Russia, and also uh, South America, for example, Colombia. What's also interesting, in some places, there are regional differences even within the country. So this is the map of Colombia showing the distribution of the Andes Cordillera here on the, on the left, and uh, gastric cancer uh, mortality rates uh, in different districts uh, on the right, so they're basically in the mountainous regions. And this, uh, this intriguing relationships, relationship actually has been known for quite some, quite some years now, that there is an association with altitude, but it's really not fully worked out. It could be just a surrogate feature for something else, diet perhaps. Uh, but any, anyhow, uh, gastric cancer uh, was really considered to be just you know, two forms of gastric cancer, sort of one disease, okay? It didn't really have a molecular classification as such. And so the major categories of gas gastric cancer are intestinal and diffuse. The intestinal gastric cancer is characterized by uh, glandular structure, and the diffuse uh, gastric cancer is characterized by poorly cohesive or uh, dispersed single cells. The cells are also called signet ring cells. They have these large vacuoles inside the cells, and they are they are dispersed and you know poorly organized. And that's a more aggressive form of cancer. Also, where they typically metastasize is different. With intestinal gastric cancer going to the liver, uh, diffuse typically going to uh, other places. Uh, so here's our feature matrix. We had nearly 300 tumor samples of uh, gastric adenocarcinoma, about 50,000 molecular features and clinical features in, this, in our feature matrix. And our first step was try to stratify these patients. Uh, so we applied a number of unsupervised uh, analysis uh, approaches, clustering approaches. Uh, one of these was a clustering of uh, platform-specific subtypes followed by another round of clustering. It's called clustering of cluster assignments. So you first cluster the individual platforms, and then you cluster the patients based on the cluster assignments from each of those individual platforms. And another method developed by Rong Lai Shen at Memorial Sloan Kettering is uh, called iCluster, which actually clusters all of the platforms at the same time. It just 
takes them all in and uh, uses a, an algorithm uh, to cluster them jointly. Uh, then we evaluated the cluster robustness and stability and identified the salient features in each of these clusters so that we could create a classification scheme that would be clinically more useful. And so this classification scheme is shown here. Uh, it, it works like this. Uh, first, there are... Uh, and this was based on the clustering analysis, I want to reemphasize. So this is based on the salient features that came from those clusters. So first is EBV, uh, so Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, so some, some of these patients are infected with EBV and it's found in the tumor. So, uh, and as you will see, there is quite a distinct molecular profile of EBV positive tumors. So that's the first subtype. And we even have uh, cool color-coded icons to represent these four subtypes. Uh, the next one is microsatellite unstable, or MSI. It's related to a hypermutation phenotype and also DNA mismatch repair, which is what it is. Uh, then the next one is the genomically stable, uh, which is characterized by a lack of uh, aneuploidy or a high degree of aneuploidy. And then chromosomally unstable, or the SYN uh, subtype, which is characterized by a high degree of aneuploidy. So here's the stomach. Here's the four different subtypes that we identified based on these salient features. And then we started looking for correlations with these subtypes. So using our correlation analysis, basically identifying interesting molecular associations as well as clinical associations. For example, one of these is where the tumor is located on the stomach anatomically. For example, chromosomally unstable tumors or the SYN subtype is, uh, is located more frequently at the gastroesophageal junction. So right here at the top of the stomach. But the, uh, the genomically stable tumors uh, occur more uh, frequently down here in the pylorus, uh, and so on. There are other associations as well. For example, as, as was known before, uh, t uh, P53 is not mutated in EBV, but the uh, chromosomally unstable tumors exhibited a strong preponderance of P53 mutations in 71% of this subtype. Also, there is a strong enrichment of MLH1 silencing in the MSI subtype. This is, of course, expected. Lower expression and increased DNA methylation of MLH1 suggests that uh, it's an important component in DNA mismatch repair, so it's, it makes sense that there would be a strong enrichment of that silencing in the MSI subtype as well. So these are actually quotes from the paper. Just, I, I just took them out from the paper. But basically, they are directly supported by, by the results in Regulome Explorer. So you can, you can literally just kind of plug in these results and reformat the, papers, uh, the, the figures to make them look more pretty. Uh, so here, here's an example of uh, another such example of a diffu uh, diffuse histological subtype uh, being enriched in the genomically stable uh, group uh, indicated by this icon. Again, going to Regulome Explorer here and choosing this variable diffuse versus intense uh, intestinal as, as our feature variable, we will immediately see a strong enrichment of the genomically stable subtype using this two, two by two contingency table and just pops up. Here's another one uh, showing what I already mentioned that the chromosomally unstable tumors occur more frequently at the GE junction. Here's the figure from the paper and here's from the Regulome Explorer. Uh, here's another one showing that the, uh, the genomically stable group uh, tended to be younger uh, and the MSI, uh, MSI group were diagnosed at relatively older ages. So here's the box plot showing the ages for these four subtypes and here they are in the, in the Regulome Explorer. Uh, another one, uh, interesting one in genomically stable group is mutations, enrichment of mutations in row A. It's a small GTPAs. Uh, uh, they, 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 the mutation sites here, these hotspots, they differ from other, other RAS family GTPases, and they're clustered in these two hotspots. 
and it actually affects the, their ability to interact with the effector molecules such as ROC1, which is shown here. This was an analysis done by uh, Brady Bernard uh, in, uh, at the ISB. Uh, and uh, so as it, is, as it may modulate the signaling downstream of row A through ROC1, it may play a role in cellular motility, which row A is known to play, and may explain the reason for this more diffuse uh, phenotype of, uh, of gastric cancer, the genomically stable subtype. Now moving on to EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, it actually is, has a fascinating methylation profile. It has greater DNA methylation than any other tumor seen in TCGA. You can see that right there, compared with some of the other tumors. Uh, in fact, also if you just look at gastric cancer and if you look at the methylation patterns, you will see that the EBV positive methylation patterns are very, very different from even the gastric CPG island meth methylator phenotype, which is this, this one here, the hyper hypermethylation phenotype. So in EBV, there is just methylation all over the place. It's kind of crazy. Uh, but there are interesting uh, therapeutic leads for EBV cancer. For example, uh, dramatic rate of mutations in PIK3CA in EBV cancer. 80% of EBV tumors have mutations in PIK3CA. And uh, PIK3CA is important for cell growth and, uh, and division. So perhaps EBV positive tumors could respond to PA3 kinase inhibitors. Some other therapeutic leads are associations with increased expression or copy number of JAK2, as well as PDL1 and PDL2, which are very potent immune suppressors, which may, may help the, the tumor evade the immune destruction. So possible therapeutics could be inhibitors of PDL1 and PDL2. Uh, we also did uh, a differentially expressed pathway analysis on gastric cancer, which is based on our association uh, analysis. So we take uh, a target variable, let's say EBV subtype, or it could be P53 mutation, any target variable that you choose. Then we identify all the correlations to that target variable, okay, from let's say gene expression. And then we score those associations relative to a set of known pathways. Here we use the NCI pathway interaction database. And so we can see which pathways are getting enriched in those associations with our target variable. So here we used the four subtypes as our target variables. We compared them to 29 normal gastric uh, samples. And we see a strong enrichment of mitotic pathways right over here. In the EBV subtype, we see a strong enrichment in immune signaling pathways like IL-12 mediated signaling. Uh, and uh, also uh, we see actually a depletion of things like HIF-1 alpha transcription factor network uh, in EBV. So it's, it's, a, it's a higher way, it's, a, it's sort of a more, uh, higher level way of looking at the associations, not on a single gene level, but on a pathway level. I just want to uh, make a shout out to uh, about the cancer, pan-cancer uh, analysis that uh, was done last year. I had the privilege of working and leading this group with uh, Josh Stewart, who is here, uh, and, uh, and Chris Sander. And this is a thread in the Nature Journals on uh, a number of different analyses, really fascinating analyses from different perspectives that were carried out on 12 tumor types uh, in TCGA. So you can, you can find the Nature Threads uh, feature there that will direct you to these various uh, papers and resources with editorials. So this was quite, a, quite an amazing resource. Uh, and also, the, the, there are plans to, to continue this kind of pan-cancer analysis, but now with all 30 tumor types once they are completed by TCGA, which will be uh, next year. Uh, so, one of the things that people often ask is, well, how can I get these data? How can I work with them? 
Uh, can I download them? Can I upload my own private data sets and look at them in conjunction with the TCGA data? So to address this, we are now in the process of, uh, of building a, a pilot cancer cloud in collaboration with Google and SRA. We were one of the awardees of an uh, NCI uh, project to establish three such uh, pilots to demonstrate uh, the ability to do everything in the cloud. So not to download a single byte of TCGA data to your computers, but just work entirely in the cloud. And I also would like to uh, uh, mention and, uh, the other two awardees, uh, the Broad Institute and Seven Bridges Genomics, which are also uh, going to be doing this, and we are thrilled to be working with them. Uh, so this is our website. There's almost nothing there yet, uh, except uh, a questionnaire for you guys. So we would like feedback and we would like to know what you want. So if I would encourage everyone to, to go to this website and fill out a very simple form that will probably take you two minutes and you can also optionally leave your email so we can contact you with updates and further information as we start building this. This is going to be a two-year project, so we expect that uh, early next year we'll already be, we'll be uh, showing you some of these capabilities. Everything will be running on Google's uh, cloud platform to bring the data and compute together. And just this is my last slide to say a few words about that. The goals of this project is to democratize access to all of these large scale repositories and computational infrastructure to make it very broadly available, to co-locate the data and the compute, to minimize the unnecessary moving of data back and forth between centers and mirroring of data. And also importantly, I, I get asked this a lot, can I integrate my private data sets with these TCGA data? How can I put them together and do a joint analysis? This is also supposed to make that simpler. Also allow web-based exploration of all of the hosted data. The same data sets that are available to computational biologists will be, will be also exposed through web-based interfaces such as Regulome Explorer for the non-computational biologists. And also, uh, one of the goals is to transform and accelerate the way people collaborate on cancer research. Right now in these TCGA working groups, there are 30, 40, 50 people working together on one project. And they have phone calls, and then they show each other PowerPoint slides over the phone. And it works. I mean, as you can see, it works, but we can do much better. There are much better ways for people to collaborate. And we think that the cloud infrastructure and the, that platform will really make that uh, much more easy and fun. So with that, I would like to acknowledge the people that did all the work. Uh, my uh, co-PI of the, uh, the Data Analysis Center in TCGA, Wei Zhang, who is at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. Vestin Thorson, uh, who led the colorectal cancer and the, the gastric cancer project from our center. Uh, Sheila Reynolds and Brady Bernard, senior uh, scientists also that have contributed um, uh, immensely to the analysis and infrastructure. Uh, and Sheila uh, is spearheading the, the new cancer uh, genomics cloud effort, this pilot with Google. Uh, and the software engineers uh, that uh, built uh, these, uh, these tools as well and acknowledged the funding from the National Cancer Institute. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Ilya, thank you very, very much for a very nice talk. Um, I want to pick a little bit on that last point of the, um, uh, the integration of, of all the data sets. So basically, on the bullet points that you listed, um, I think the one thing that, that is sort of missing is the integration of tools. So uh, I mean, right now, I feel that you know, every cloud out there, it's sort of its own cloud. And there's no atmosphere sort of linking them together. And I can either sort of move my entire group to this cloud and sort of work on that or move it to some other cloud and work there. But I feel that as it's not only about data, it's also about tools. So basically yeah. part of the reason why people download big data chunks is because their tools are sitting locally. So I'm just wondering if, you know, I mean, obviously Google is thinking a lot about that. But 
there's also sort of a little bit of the aspect of a monopoly where, you know, Amazon wants everybody there and Google wants everybody there and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So my question is, are you working with these guys or are they thinking independently about how to actually make it seamless as to where you do your development so that I can go on the Google Cloud, develop something, and then immediately I can have access to it on the Amazon Cloud and so on and so forth? That's a great question. Uh, so I think the short answer is absolutely we're thinking about integrating tools and allowing people to bring their tools. So we're going to be making available uh, you know, VMs with standard libraries and people can install their stuff. So basically you can work there the same way you would work at home. Uh, and also these APIs that we're going to be using are all open. So for example, Google's genomic API, it follows the global alliance standard and it's an open API. I mean, they're, of course, they have their own implementation, but in, in principle, you could implement the same API on Amazon or on your local cluster. So certainly the idea is to make to also make it possible for people to share tools and to, uh, and to bring their own tools to this environment. And I've already been contacted by a number of vendors that are doing workflows and they're very excited about putting it onto the platform so that you, know, you can have an ecosystem of tools and workflows that people would have access to. And ideally it will all interoperate. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly what I hear every time that you can bring in things. But my question is, as I make changes to these things, can I the next day use that updated version of my, on my other cloud? On your other cloud? Yeah, so basically not about bringing, but about sort of continuing the development in parallel. But anyway, I mean, these, are, these are, you know, Right. Well, so actually, so uh, those are exactly the kinds of uh, feedback we would love to have since yeah. we're just getting started. And so we want to make sure we do this right and that we address all of the concerns and the needs of the community. And uh, but certainly the, you know, the short answer is we definitely plan to make it as easy and sort of democratized as possible to right. make it for people to easy to update and share their tools. I think it's uh, extremely exciting. That I, I, I can see a transformation happening here and you guys are definitely sort of leading the way on that. So. Thank you. Very Thank much you. Nice. I have one question. Yes. Uh, so for the first part of your talk, uh, you talk about uh, computing associations between different data sets on the Cancer Regulon website. So uh, yesterday we also discussed like there is heterogeneity within the samples, within the tumor, and also there is data dependency, like cancer copy number will correlate to methylation. And if you try, try to associate these two data sets to the expression, some of the interactions may be the artifact of the data or the dependency. Do you do anything? extra to handle this kind of issues? Mm, we do not. So we leave the flexibility to the user to adjust the stringency of these relationships. So you can see more or less. So you can basically, you have a knob that you can turn and you can see, you know, so you're right. Some associations are just more prevalent than others. Other types like methylation or copy number to expression. And so we just, we just leave that alone. We don't do any kind of correction except we also do multiple testing corrections. So we provide corrected and uncorrected p-values for the user, but we don't do any other steps, so we just kind of leave it raw the way it is. But yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, from our experience, it seems like TCGA has very limited information about clinical information from those uh, uh, yeah. samples. Uh, in your project, I don't know if you have uh, uh, access uh, from your website. Can we get a, access to this clinical information such as uh, uh, molecular subtype and survival information. This, 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 this information that's very, very important. Yes, indeed. Uh, so generally, you are right that TCGA isn't great uh, for clinical data. There is some clinical data and it varies from cancer to cancer, but it's not uniform. So for exactly. some cancers, you might know like there's smoking history, but for some other cancer, there is no smoking history. So there is that problem. But we do make all the data that is available in TCGA through our portal. So you can look at all of these things like where they are available, like survival, it's available for some cancers, but not, an, not for others. Uh, most of it is unprotected or uncontrolled data, so it's all available, aggregated here. Some data are protected, controlled access data, and then you, of course, need permission to access that from, through the NIH to get the authorization to access those data. But those are very few. Um, most of the clinical data is not controlled, and it's available here, like subtypes and so on. 
And by the way, subtype is not really a clinical feature. It's more like a, we call it like a tumor sample feature. So that is something that can be derived by another analysis, like a subtype of GBM, proneural, classical, mesenchymal. Okay, so that's, we don't think of that as a clinical feature, but we think of it as a tumor sample specific feature. And so we also ingest a lot of these features from other tools like the Broad's Firehose. Firehose does a lot of analysis and they do cluster assignments and so on. So we pull all those features into our feature matrix so you can do association with those as well. Okay, great. Uh, another question is, uh, you showed one slide about MIR-21 association with uh, MSI and the RAF mutations. That's a s score, right? Yeah. I was wondering, uh, that, is that a analysis purely correlation based? Uh, so you don't really look into like a presumably what kind of targets those mirrors could uh, have? Well, in the paper, there is a little bit of analysis. I didn't talk about that. The analysis of some of those targets of those MERS, including MER21. Uh, our tools don't do this kind of analysis yet, so there is no way to load in the you know target uh, you know uh, microRNA targets uh, from some database into this tool. So you have to do this yourself. Uh, hopefully, once we take everything to the cloud, it will be much easier to do this kind of analysis uh, quicker, to combine these associations with other, uh, other information like networks. Thanks. Thank you. If there's, if there's no other questions, I'd like to present the certificate to the speaker, and then we can all go to lunch. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much.